Hello, everybody, from the California Board of Accountancy offices here in beautiful Sacramento. I would like to welcome you to the Pathway to Your CPA. Thank you for joining us this evening. So whether you've made up your mind that becoming a CPA is your career path or you just want to learn what about what the accounting profession is about, we've designed the next 90 minutes just for you. We hope you will find it informative and leave here tonight with the knowledge you'll need to feel confident heading down your pathway to your CPA. My name is David Hemphill. I'm on the communications team here at the CBA. That's what we like to call the California Board of Accountancy. It's a little shorter, right? CBA. In a moment, I will introduce you to our esteemed panel who will be sharing with us from their wealth of accounting experience. But first, here is how the evening is going to flow. Throw the agenda up here for you to look at. So we're going to begin with presentations about exactly what is the role of the CBA, what are the requirements you'll need to fulfill in order to take the CPA exam, and then once you pass the final requirements to obtain your CPA license. After the presentations, we'll get into our panel discussion. Our panelists will cover a variety of topics geared toward you getting started in the accounting profession. When the panel discussion wraps up, we will finish the evening with a question and answer session opening things up to you to ask questions about anything you heard in the presentations or the panel topics. I will be joined by Denise Murata, the CBA's examination unit manager. You can wave and say hello, Denise, <laughs> for the presentation portion. Then CBA staff members, Jennifer Jackson from the exams unit and Diane Edwards from the initial licensing unit. They will expertly answer your questions later in the Q&A portion. All right, so now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our panel. We are happy to be joined by Michael Hurley, a partner at Farber Haas Hurley, an accounting firm based in Southern California. He's practiced both public and private accounting in his career and is also currently a member of the California Society of CPAs Peer Review Committee. Hello, Mr. Hurley. Hello, David. There you are. Very good. Thanks for being here. We appreciate you. We're also honored to have Robert A. Lee, the managing partner and CEO of Robert Lee and Associates, a leading Silicon Valley accounting firm. He also consults business executives, providing innovative solutions for their organizations, and has previously served on two of the CBA's advisory committees, including the Enforcement Advisory Committee. Hello, Mr. Lee. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you and happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Our next two panelists are both members of the California Board of Accountancy and not just members, but officers of the board. Michael M. Savoy is the longest tenured member of the CBA. He served on the board since 2010, including as president in the past. He is currently the CBA's vice president as well as working as of counsel for BPM, a major accounting and advisory firm. And he's also treasurer of the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. Hello, Mr. Savoy. Hello, David. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for doing this after October 15th. <laughs> Very good. I, have, I suspect why that may be, but uh, we can't get into that. <laughs> Glad you're with us. And now the fourth piece of our brain trust, Nancy J. Corrigan has served as president of the California Board of Accountancy for the last two years. Prior to her CBA appointment, she served on all three of the CBA's advisory committees for over 15 years. Now working as a consultant, she's also a member of the Cal Poly Pomona Accounting Department's advisory board, and she's a proud Bronco. She will begin our presentations by telling you all about the role of the CBA Hello, Ms. Corrigan, I hand it over to you. Hello, and thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. I am a certified public accountant. I serve as president of the California Board of Accountancy, which you will often be heard, referred to as the CBA. On behalf of all of our board members, not just the two we have here, the 100 excellent staff, very qualified staff that we have that make up the staff of the CBA and the regulating of 111,000 licensees 
in California, the most of any state in the nation, and it is ever growing, and we welcome that as our board. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. We are pleased that you have an interest in pursuing your CPA license, and it is our desire to help you along your pathway and beyond. I hope you will find this session beneficial and informative as you hear how to earn your CPA license directly from the California Board of Accountancy. That's the best source for this information. So exactly what is the CBA and what do we do? Well, the CBA is a state agency. It regulates the practice of public accountancy in California that issues CBA licenses to those who have met the requirements under the law. Our mission is the protection of consumers, and this includes individuals or businesses that rely on services provided by CPAs in California, whether directly or indirectly. This important mission underscores everything that we do at the CBA. We are responsible for evaluating all California candidates for CBA licensure, determining whether they meet the requirements to become licensed, and if they do, then issuing licenses to those who have met those stringent requirements. We also maintain continuing education requirements to ensure the competency of CPAs even after they receive their licenses. This ensures that they will continue to practice in accordance with professional standards and keep the quality level of the CPA profession high in California especially. As David mentioned, the CBA also has three advisory committees that some of those present have served on, and they are made up of dedicated CPAs who see the personal and professional benefit of giving back to the accounting profession by volunteering on one of these committees. And this is something you may wanna consider as you become a CPA in your career. As David mentioned, I served on all three of the committees before I was appointed to the board this allowed me to even more fully understand the process of becoming a CPA, to be involved with enforcement issues that arise for those CPAs who do not follow professional standards and rules and regulations, and to oversee the peer review process for CPAs that perform certain accounting and auditing services. In a few minutes, as was mentioned, Denise Murata and David Hemphill of the CPA will explain the requirements to become a CPA. And if you're unsure about anything you hear, anything that they say this evening, please do not hesitate to ask about it or even at a later time to contact us at the CBA so that all of your questions are answered. Later, we will have a question and answer time with Jennifer Jackson from the CBA Examination Unit and Diane Edwards from the CBA Initial Licensing Unit. Our staff are very knowledgeable about the entire process because this is what they do every day, and they will be happy to answer any questions you may have. That's why we're here for you this evening. So I e hope each of you will consider the rewarding path of becoming a CPA. I look forward to speaking with you further during the, during the panel discussion a little bit later this evening. But first, I will now hand our program over to Denise Murata, the manager of the CBA Examination Unit to discuss the requirements which need to be met in order to qualify to take the CPA exam. Denise? Thank you, President Corrigan. Good evening, everyone. My name is Denise Murata, and I'm the Examination Unit Manager at the CBA. And I'm here to explain all the requirements to qualify to take the CPA exam and what the application process looks like. Hopefully, by the end of this, you'll have a good understanding of what you need to do to be prepared and succeed in passing the CPA exam. If you think of any questions while we're speaking or giving a presentation, just jot them down. Um, at the end of the uh, this, we will have a Q&A session and you can um, get your questions answered there. First, let me tell you a little bit about the exam itself, which is your first step towards CPA licensure. The CPA exam, which is short for Uniform, Cert Uniform Certified Public Accountant Examination, is a national computer-based exam designed to test and to test the skills and competencies that you will enter to enter into the practice of public accountancy. There are four sections, and each section is four hours long. The sections are auditing and attestation, business environment and concepts, financial accounting and reporting and regulation. 
Please keep in mind the CPA exam is undergoing changes that are anticipated to take effect in the year 2024. I'll give you a little more detail about that on these changes a little later. So, how do you qualify to sit for the CPA exam? Most of you are working on completing your bachelor's degree if you haven't already. Once, it, once you've earned your degree, you fulfilled one of the major requirements of the CPA exam. The other two requirements deal specifically with the coursework needed. You need to have completed 24 semester units in accounting courses and 24 semester units in business related courses, or as we like to call it, the 24 and 24. Once you've met all three requirements, you're ready to apply for the CPA exam. I would like to take this opportunity to announce that starting January 1st of 2022, the CBA will allow candidates to apply and be approved to sit for the exam prior to a degree conferral if they are within 180 days of completing the educational requirements. CBA staff are currently working on implementing this plan, so please monitor the CBA website for important updates. So, when you're ready to apply, you should request your official transcript to be sent to the CBA. There are three ways you can have them sent. You can have your transcripts mailed directly to the CBA from your school or schools if you've attended more than one. Obtain official sealed and mail, obtain official sealed transcripts and mail them yourself along with your CPA application or order an electronic transcript to be emailed to the CBA using a CBA approved provider. You can find a list on the CBA website of all the approved providers. The CBA also has a dedicated email address to send your transcripts to, which is CBA transcripts at cba.ca.gov. Here's an important thing to take note of. You want to make sure that your degree has been conferred on the transcript. If it gets sent without the degree note noted on the transcript, we'll have to ask you to send it again, and that could delay things a bit. This is the most common issue when we find when we're reviewing applications. Again, if you're applying on or after July 1st of 2022, you may be approved without a degree conferral. Education completed outside the United States is acceptable, but it must be evaluated by CBA approved credential evaluation service. The evaluation service will provide your evaluation to the CBA. The list of evaluation service providers is also on the CBA website at the address you see on the slide. After, your after you request your transcripts or foreign evaluations to be sent to us, it's now time to create your very own online CBA client account. So the client account will allow you to create an application of remittance forms, which I'll talk about more in a bit. And it also lets you check the status of your exam application and view your scores once you start taking the exam. Even though you will be creating your client account online, the application itself will still need to be printed, signed, and mailed to us along with the application processing fees. These forms cannot be submitted electronically at this time. Once you've completed these steps, your job for applying for the CPA exam is done. It is then up to the CBA to help you get approved. When we receive all the required documents, we will review your file and determine if you've met the requirements, which are the 24 accounting units and the 24 business related units and a bachelor's degree. If the CBA determines that you have met all the requirements, then you are approved. You will receive an email notification with the instructions on your next steps. If you don't meet the requirements just yet, we'll, we will email you to let you know what's missing and you can get work get working on fixing those. So once you are approved, now the real fun begins. Your client account will update and allow you to begin selecting your exam selections. Remember, there are four sections of the CPA exam and the order that you take each section is completely up to you. Most candidates prefer to spend their, spread out their four sections to allow them plenty of study time and taking into consideration their work schedule and personal commitments. The CPA exam is off, offered continuously throughout the year. Okay, so now I've got some acronyms for you. And trust me, by the end of this entire process, you'll know all of these. So the first is ATT, 
and I'm not talking about the phone service. It stands for authorization to test. When you select, select which section or sections you want to take first, the CBA sends an ATT to NASBA, which is the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You'll get to know NASBA very well also. Once NASBA receives your ATT, it will issue you a payment coupon. There's no acronym for this one, it's just payment coupon. The payment coupon is good for 90 days, so make sure you submit your exam section fees to NASBA during that time. It's important to know that once you've paid the selection fee, the section fees, you can't change your mind once it, or remove or add any sections. So if you need to make any changes, you must request them to the CBA before you pay NASBA and prior to the expiration of your payment coupon. So once NASBA receives your payment, it will issue you the another acronym NTS, which is Notice to Schedule. Each NTS is valid for nine months and you must schedule and sit for your selected se sections within the nine month period. Make sure your NTS matches the spelling of your name on your identification cards that you will plan to bring with you to the testing center. We don't want you to be denied entrance. If your information is not shown correctly, please let us know right away so we can get that fixed. Okay, so now it's time to get serious about prepping for the CPA exam. An all night caffeine filled cram session is not recommended in studying for the exam. Not that any of you would ever do anything like that. There is definitely help out there to assist you in preparing for the CPA exam. The exam is developed by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, or AICPA. On their website, AICPA provides CPA exam blueprints where you can also learn about the specific topics tested in each section. You can also find sample tests and tutorial topics that will help you prepare for and when you hopefully pass the exam. These are big help, big, these are big helps in which I hope you will take advantage of. So when you're ready to schedule your exam, it will be time to get to know the company name of Prometrics. They are the te oper they operate testing centers all around the world and they will be the ones administering the CPA exam to you. Schedule your exam by taking your exam section by using Prometrics online scheduling tool or by contacting them over the phone. Prometric testing centers are normally open six days a week. The CBA allows you to test at any of Prometrics locations in the United States, District of Columbia, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and Guam. It is even possible to test outside these areas as the CBA participates in the NASBA slash AICPA I exam process, which allows candidates to test in spe specified international prometric testing centers. You can find information about I exam and testing internationally on NASBA's website at www.nasba.org. So once you've got your exam scheduled and the day arrives, here are a couple tips. I highly recommend that you arrive 30 to 45 minutes before your appointment. This gives you plenty of time to locate the testing center, find parking, because you never know what is going to happen that day. And, and you will also be able to complete the check-in process. You definitely don't want to feel rushed or stressed on an important test. And don't forget to bring your NTS and valid, valid identification. Without these, you will not be allowed to test and you will lose the exam fees that you've already paid. So congratulations, you took your exam and now you feel pretty good about how you did. Thanks to all the studying that you put in, but how long do you have to wait to find out if you've passed and how do you get your score? So here's how it goes. Based on the dates that you see on the slide, if you took the exam today, you can expect to receive your score on November 9th. You can view all the target score release dates on the AICPA website. You will find your score in your online client account. NASBA releases everyone's scores to the CBA and then they are automatically uploaded to your account, generally the night of the target date. <laughs> For security reasons, scores cannot be released via email or telephone. A score of 75 or higher means you've passed. Great job. 
In order to pass the entire CPA exam, you will need to pass the four exam sections that I mentioned earlier within an 18th month period. The date you pass your first section will start the clock on this 18th month period. If one of your exam credits expires prior to passing all four parts, then you will need to retake that section. When you have passed the CPA exam, we'll send you a congratulatory letter with your information and your next steps on obtaining your CPA license. When you're ready to apply for your California CPA license, there are some additional requirements to meet. But before I turn it over to David to discuss that process, I'd like to take a little time to talk about the 2024 CPA exam. So, as I mentioned earlier, the CPA exam will be undergoing changes that are expected to launch in January of 2024. The 2024 CPA exam is not yet finalized, but since you are in the future of account the accounting profession, it may actually be taking a new version of the exam. I just want to make you guys aware. So the coming changes referred to as CPA evolution is a joint effort between NASBA and AICPA aimed at transforming the overall licensure model to focus more on the rapidly changing technolo technological skills and competencies that the accounting practice requires today and will require in the future. I'll go into more detail in a moment. Along with NASBA and AICPA, the state CPA societies, state boards of accountancy, academia, firms of all sizes, and CPAs in all areas of practice from all across the country are vital partners to helping prepare for the CPA evolution. It's pretty exciting stuff. Their collaboration and support in implementing the new CPA licensure model will help the profession remain strong and relevant for your time in the industry, while protecting the public interest in a constantly changing business environment. In addition to the changes to the CPA exam itself, there are changes happening to the licensure model as well. As a part of the CPA evolution, NASBA and the AICPA are moving forward with a core plus discipline model. The CPA exam will continue to test candidates' core competencies. While not yet finalized, it is anticipated that the core will include accounting, auditing, and tax with technology embedded within each of these core competencies. In addition to these three core areas, candidates will be expected to demonstrate more in-depth knowledge in one of these proposed disciplines, business analysis and reporting, information systems and controls, or tax compliance and planning. So this model will enhance public prote protection by producing candidates who have the deep knowledge necessary to perform high quality work be responsive to feedback by requiring all candidates to demonstrate strong core competencies, require deeper proven knowledge in one of the three disciplines that are the pillars to the, of the profession, and be adaptive and flexible in helping to future-proof the CPA as the profession evolves. And regardless of which discipline a candidate may choose, there will be only one CPA license, so a candidate's chosen discipline does not mean that the CPA is limited to that practice area. Even with this new model, your option to apply for either a G, general license, or an A, a test license will not change. The specific content of the core and disciplines will be determined by the State Accountancy Board, Education Requirements, and a CPA exam practice analysis, which is periodically conducted by AICPA to maintain the validity and reliability. For more information about CPA evolution and the proposed changes to the exam, you can visit the CPA evolution website at evolutionofcpa.org. The page is updated when new information is provided, so check back at the website from time to time. Thank you all for your attention, and I hope you feel comfortable now with what to expect on the CPA exam, and I wish you the best of luck for lots of passing scores. I now turn it over to back to David Hemphill to provide an overview of the licensing requirements and application process. All right, thank you very much, Denise. Okay, so here we go. I will now discuss the licensure requirements and application process to obtain your CPA license. So as you prepare to apply for licensure, it's important that you do your best to have all necessary requirements met 
so your application process can be as smooth an experience as possible. When you qualified to sit for the CPA exam, you met most of the education requirements to obtain your license, but not quite all of them. There are a few additional requirements for licensure, and those include these 20 semester units of accounting study on top of the 24 units required to take the CPA exam and 10 semester units of ethics study, three of which must be in a course in accounting ethics or accountants professional responsibilities. And then there's that total, a minimum of 150 total semester units. There's an also, uh, also an experience requirement for licensure. You will need to complete a minimum of one year of general accounting experience under the supervision of an actively licensed CPA. When accepting job offers, it's best to inform your employer of your intent to pursue a CPA license to ensure they are eligible to sign off on your experience. It's a good idea to have your experience form signed and submitted to the CPA as you earn it, regardless of whether you're ready to apply or not. Applicants and supervisors may change jobs or relocate, and it can be sometimes difficult to locate the person you need to sign it at a later date. We'll keep it on file until you're ready to apply. Completion of the general accounting experience requirement will allow you to perform all of the services of a CPA, except for signing reports on attest engagements, which includes planning audits, preparing work papers, and preparing full disclosure financial statements. If you do want to be able to sign reports on attest engagements, you will need to complete an additional 500 hours in attest functions under the supervision of a licensed CPA who is also authorized to sign reports on attest engagements. Once your education and, and, and experience requirements have been satisfied, you're almost there. But just a couple last things you must do in order to obtain your CPA license. The first is pathing, passing an ethics exam. It's called the Professional Ethics Examination, or PETH. It's administered online by the California Society of CPAs, or CalCPA, and that test is specific to California. Once you pass the PETH exam, CalCPA will send your score to the CBA electronically. Your test results for the PETH exam are valid for two years. If your application is not submitted within those 24 months, you will have to take the PETH again. The final box to check is submitting fingerprints, which will be used to conduct a criminal history background check. Authorization and information on how to complete this will be sent to you after we receive your CPA application. An exciting improvement the CBA recently made is the introduction of an online application for CPA licensure. You can now submit your CPA application and pay the processing fee with a credit card entirely online. Just go to the CBA website to get started. The paper application is still available. If you just absolutely love driving to the post office and using stamps, you can still do it that way if you want. When submitting your application, be sure to include an email address so we can notify you more quickly if there's anything needed to complete your file. Once the CBA has received your application and fee, you will receive an acknowledgement email, including the authorization and instructions for getting fingerprinted. Live scan forms and fingerprint cards will be provided to you by the CBA. CBA staff will review the application and notify you of the outcome. This should happen within 30 days, although we're currently processing licensure applications in less than two weeks. If an application is approved for licensure, the CBA will provide you with an approval notification and instructions to submit your initial license fee if you didn't do it already in the online application. If an application is not approved for licensure, you will be sent a letter advising what is outstanding. The CBA provides additional tools that will help you during the application process for both the CPA exam or the CPA license, which are available on the CPA web, CBA website. There is a self-assessment worksheet that helps you track your classes and plan for any future education you may need. There's also an education tip sheet that breaks down the requirements and will help you determine where a particular course may qualify. 
The CBA website has a wealth of information available to you all along the pathway to your CPA license. If you click on the applicants tab, you see circled there, you will find the online applications, links to the various forms we just spoke about, as well as the Uniform CPA Examination Handbook and the Licensing Applicant Handbook. These handbooks are like the instruction manuals that tell you how to set up your phone or how to put together that piece of furniture you just bought. All the details about everything you might need to know are in there if you want to read them. <laughs> it's good stuff. There are also a bunch of frequently asked questions, FAQs, that others just like you have asked in the past, you can find those on the website, that hopefully can assist you in understanding the various requirements and procedures to qualify and apply for your CPA exam and CPA license. The CBA offers licensure assistance programs for past and present military personnel and their spouses or domestic partners as well as refugees, asylees, and special immigrant visa holders. The CBA has a dedicated military and refugee liaison, Jennifer Jackson, who can assist you. For more information, you can visit the Military Refugee section of our webpage, which you see circled there, which can be accessed from that tab circled on the home page. The CBA understands the time and commitment you make when you're pursuing your CPA license, and we want to make that process as seamless as possible for you. In addition to all the help that I've mentioned available on our website, CBA staff is dedicated to assisting you every step of the way. If you have a question you just can't figure out the answer to at any time during your application process, we encourage you to email, you, email us at the appropriate address that you see here. You can also find these addresses in the Contact Us section of the website. We also encourage you to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can sign up for email updates. This will help you stay informed of any new developments that may occur here at the CBA. All right, well, thank you for listening and for the opportunity to present all this information for you today. Hopefully you now have a much better understanding of what lies ahead on the pathway to your CPA license. So if all of that information sparked any questions, which it probably did, hang on to them for just a few more minutes. I'm gonna open the question and answer session uh, in just a little bit. So hang on to those because right now it's time to have a lot of knowledge and expertise dropped on us in our panel discussion. So I'm going to stop sharing this and we're gonna get back to our panelists. All right, hello again, panelists. So first question now for our panel, I wanna know what has been the value of your CPA license to your career and why should the several hundred students or uh, accounting professionals go for a CPA license. President Corrigan, I'll start with you. Well, thank you, David. Um, I gave some thought to this and I guess what I would offer to the students is that my license has given me a broad spectrum of opportunities from which to choose a career. And it's made me as presented on my resume, a very marketable commodity in the marketplace in searching for a position and competing with, with others. Uh, the CPA license has designate, designated me as a trusted professional that follows a body of professional standards and laws and regulations, which is just at the very core of what we do as CPAs. And there is a very high demand for qualified CPAs right now. So I would encourage them to really consider pursuing a career such as this. Thank you. Mr. Savoy, what about you? Thank you. Having looked back over my 48 year uh, career, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm careful to say career because it's very important that you look at this as a career and not a job. That'll make you much more successful. When I first started out, I wanted to be a partner in a CPA firm. Well, day one, it's fairly impossible to achieve that. Uh, but 10 years later, you know, there I was. And as a partner in a CPA firm, the possibilities 
for instance, being a member of the California Board of Accountancy, being on other boards, whether it's the LA Chamber, it just opens up tremendous possibilities to choose whatever you want to do. It's incredible, but those three letters, CPA after your name, gives you certain respect, as Nancy had mentioned, as the most trusted financial advisor to your clients and even to your friends on the golf course. I tell them they get what they pay for, uh, so free advice is just what that is, but it's been a very rewarding and it's endless in terms of what you can do with those three letters. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Yeah, I think I would actually echo that, uh, what Mr. Savoy said. I think the thing that those three letters, being able to put that after your name, puts you in a different light than anybody else who may want to try and call themselves an accountant. It'll also open up doors for you that aren't open to other people. You'll see in the job listings, CPA required. And that may, you know, that could be at a public accounting firm and it could be an industry. But having those letters will open doors for you that you're not going to be have have available to you otherwise. Thank you, Mr. Hurley. What about you? I'll, I'll echo much of the other statements, but I'll share. I started in uh, private industry. I, I could not get a job with a CPA from when I graduated. It was a tough year in 1975. Um, <laughs> and, and I got to know that company I was doing the accounting for very well. But once I joined the CPA firm, I realized I could learn in one year what would take me 40 years to learn in one company because I could see so many different companies, the way they operated, the way they worked, the way their accounting systems worked. I became instantly more valuable. After my big firms merged and I decided to go private again for a while, I realized I was at an entirely different level and able to command much more respect and much more compensation. And then only after a year, year and a half of being back in private, I realized public is where the fun was. And I have to share, I, any college student, any of my grandchildren, I would say, go into public accounting. It's a great place to be at and it's a great place to be from. It's an education you can't get anywhere else. Thank you. All right, so if we've managed to convince everyone now that uh, CPA is the career path we wanna go down, there's such a variety of different job opportunities that could be afforded to a CPA. So I would like for you all to kind of speak to that, whether it's maybe different jobs you've held in your career or just others that you know that you know of that could be very interesting. So President Corrigan, start with you. Some of the different jobs that uh, some of our viewers today could could get as a CPA. Thank you. Well, as a CPA and you've got your license experience behind you, uh, there's a choice of public accounting, such as with a CPA firm or private industry with a privately held company or publicly traded company. And myself, my experience was primarily um, smaller local firms uh, and, until in the, nearing the end uh, where I merged my firm into a larger firm and worked there for a while too. But I was a generalist, primarily accountant auditor type with general tax experience and lots of management advisory services for my clients. But in a midsize or larger firm, one can choose to be a specialist in many areas of auditing, for-profit, non-profit, employee benefit plans, you know, those are just a few. In tax, you can become a federal or state tax expert and many, many other uh, areas within those. Those are very broad categories. Uh, and I could also, as a CPA, become a peer reviewer, uh, such as Mike Hurley did. And uh, so there's very important work to be done there. In private industry, I could be a CFO for a privately held or, or publicly held company or other positions such as that. And I could even eventually own my own company, say a manufacturing company, and I would understand the basis for the accounting and the business model for that company, which is very important. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Savoy, you seem to wear a number of hats <laughs> at this time. Uh, as well, maybe speak to uh, some of that in your experience with some of the different roles that you hold. Yeah, I mean, since I've been in public accounting my entire career, 
I have seen folks, you know, that have strayed from the public accounting arena uh, and went into private industry, whether it's investment banking or, as Nancy said, owning your own company. But for me, it's opened up opportunities uh, to be on boards. And that's something I really enjoy. For me, it's about giving back to the profession that has been so good to me for 48 years. It's been very rewarding. Uh, I've sat on numerous boards, uh, haven't gotten paid yet for being on boards. That would be my next step, but I understand those <laughs> board positions are like Dodger season tickets and Hollywood bowl tickets. Nobody ever gives them up, uh, but it, it's a springboard for opportunities that are endless. And yes. basically you can do pretty much whatever you want to do, having the expertise and experience of basically being involved in all different industries, all different phases, and whatever you really want to do in your next life, you can do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, maybe you could speak a little to, since I know you do a lot of advising for a lot of different clients, uh, you mentioned presidents or other board members, things like that. Maybe some of a variety of the industries that require services of yours and of a CPA. Sure. My, my client base is quite, quite diverse. Uh, we do a lot of nonprofit work. We do a lot of for-profit work. We even have digital, digital asset uh, work that we're doing at this point in time. So there's, there's an, ex um, the world is your oyster. I think when it comes to what's available to you to do, whether that's um, um, IT auditing, assurance work uh, through through the larger accounting systems, or or working on uh, making sure that the tax returns are, are filled out correctly, and then strategizing on what that is. I think the longer you're in this career in public accounting, the more knowledge you will gain, and the more people will come to you to look for your insights and the strategies that, that you may be able to bring to the table. I think we did a wonderful job in explaining to you how you get those letters. And I would say there's one other unwritten requirement in my mind, and that is I really want you to, be, to really like to solve problems. If you don't like to solve problems, this is not a good industry for you um, because people will come to you with their problems. I often joke with my clients and say, people don't call me because they're trying to figure out how I'm doing and whether or not I'm having a good day. They're calling me because they need something. So it's nice to be needed. It's nice to be able to bring the answers because you've got the experience. And I think that's what people will look for you to. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Hurley, you do have, you know, experience both in the, the private accounting and the public accounting sides. Do you want to maybe talk about some some of your best parts of each one, maybe pros and cons, maybe there's no so cons, but. <laughs> when I was a controller for an aerospace manufacturing company, I could tell you a whole lot about aerospace and, and making bolts and widgets and you know anything that goes on an airplane. <laughs> but once I got into public, I realized I, I learned so much about so many different kinds of companies. And one of the really fun things about coming Earning your certificate, you'll be exposed to a lot of different companies, a lot of different people's problems. And going back to what Robert had just said, um, forgive me, some people think I'm smarter than I am because somebody will ask me a question and I will have heard the problem from Michael Savoy or Nancy Corrigan, whose peer reviews I've done. And I learn from them and I share it with, you know, the next person and they think I'm a genius. When all I'm doing is passing information amongst our, our, our knowledgeable body. Um, the CPA certificate gives you credibility and it, it, it's proof of your exposure that you've had throughout your career. And I, I will share, I, I'm on several not-for-profit boards where I think I'm the only person who knows how to read a financial statement. I also share, I'm on a board of a for-profit company that pays me a handsome fee and it's much more fun to be paid to be on a board. <laughs> and that's exactly why we're all here, right? Is to share, we're just trying to absorb all the knowledge that you're all giving to us. Can you maybe speak a little more about the whole peer review process because that's something we haven't really discussed, but it's something that is important when you're further on in the career. So kind of talk about what 
you know, what, how that's benefited you. And so what done. a couple, three things. When peer review first became voluntary in 1988, uh, I was amongst the first to get peer reviewed because I, would, I did public company audits and I needed a peer review. And it was very hard for me to find somebody who was qualified to do my peer review. So after I was reviewed and passed, I thought, well, you know, that guy didn't know that much more than me. He's a peer. I can be a peer. So I signed up for team captain school and learned how to do document peer reviews. And that's how I met Nancy. And that's how I met Michael. And that's how I've met maybe a thousand other CPAs. And I love our profession and we are just good people. And my role as a peer reviewer is to go into somebody else's firm and look, look at their work papers, make sure their work papers are meeting standards, make sure that there's up to date with all the new rules and regulations. And sadly, there are new rules and regulations all the time. And part of our role as peer reviewers is to get to firms and help them improve before the regulators come after them. And after Enron, Peer review became mandatory for all CPA firms, and my 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 business blossomed in terms of doing a lot of peer reviews for a lot of other firms. And every firm I learned something from, every firm I hope to impart some knowledge, and it's one of the things that separates us from a lot of other industries. We really police ourselves, and we're really out to help each other. You don't get this in law firms. You don't get this in the medical profession to nearly the same degree. We are here to help each other. We are one big family to protect the public and, and provide good services. Oh, I, something I'd like to mention that Robert had touched on briefly. I deal with a lot of attorneys. My favorite attorneys far and away, bar none, are those that were CPAs also. I'm shocked how many attorneys can't speak the language of business and have no understanding of financial statements. and wherever you want to go in life that cpa certificate will help you get there great thank you mr hurley so you mentioned enron so i guess that's a good time to shift to talk about ethics and why it is so important that ethics goes hand in hand part of the process of your educational requirements is ethics studies you have to pass an ethics exam in order for the uh you know to to earn your CPA license. So, President Corgan, speak to that. Why why are ethics so important to the profession? Well, with the CBA, I mentioned uh, the mission being consumer protection. So, clients, consumer, individuals, businesses rely on us for very important guidance and services that impact their financial safety and security. Believe it or not, many individuals, businesses, uh look to their finances more than they might their personal well-being and health i mean it's very very vital to them and um they need to be able to rely on us as i think michael savoy mentioned trusted advisors and so we must be ethical and maintain an ethical attitude throughout they rely on us to apply technical accounting standards and auditing standards, tax rules and regulations that have a significant impact on their financial well-being. And that strong ethical demeanor promotes the trust. So it's all tied together and very, very crucial that that remain in place. Mr. Savoy, could you jump in on that? Because I know you deal with a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, clients and you have over your over your decades what does that trust mean to you and how important is that? I, you know, I've gained a more thorough understanding and appreciation for ethics, having been on the California Board of Accountants for almost 12 years. It is amazing how many people think a CPA license is a license to steal. I can, you know, I can only talk about published cases, not cases we're working on. And I hate to say the most enjoyable part of my role on the California Board of Accountancy is discipline and enforcement. Because as Nancy mentioned, we oversee 111,000 CPAs. Uh, unbelievable amount within the state of California. And so many of them come before us that just have forgotten 
the importance of ethics, to be fair, to be honest, and to be credible are the three most important things that you have outside of those three letters after your name. And as long as I serve, I will continue uh, to try and teach other CPAs that it is very important to be ethical and also as a trusted advisor that people are listening to you. And when you say something, it's like EF Hutton years ago, everybody should listen. <laughs> I remember that commercial. <laughs> Mr. Lee, do you want to jump in? These have all been all really good comments on, on the ethics side. I think maybe the thing that I might add on that is oftentimes I think CPAs forget that our client is not always just the person that's paying our fee. Because as was said earlier, the public is relying on the information and the person that pays our fee is only one piece of that oftentimes because those financial statements may be off to the bank, may be off to underwriters, may be headed to investors. And understanding that it, you know, our responsibilities extend beyond the person that pays our bill. Mr. Hurley. Everybody's, we all agree, ethics are very important. I will share openly that when I was first new uh, in my own practice, I was continually advised to only pick good clients. You know, just don't take anybody, but, you know, only accept clients that are uh, ethical. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm hungry. I need all the jobs I can get. Well, the wisdom of that advice has been proven to me many times over. Uh, you don't want to deal with people who are unethical. And if a CPA, if somebody does something wrong, someone might thank them for it once, but they'll never trust them. Uh, our, our lives are, are enriched by the fact that our clients trust us. We are the trusted advisor. We're the first ones they call when they have a problem. And we don't want to ever give that up. And if we show bendable ethics, if we show that we're not straight, we'll very quickly lose that. It, it's the cornerstone of our profession and we need to maintain it at all times. Great. And I'm confident the next generation of future CPAs, the many, many of you out there watching tonight, I'm sure you will keep this and run with it and, and do your awesome ethical job. So let's just kind of finish off by talking about what tips would you have for everyone when they're ready to uh, jump in, they've got their CPA license and any tips for successful entry? Because you read all about how in demand this, those with the CPA license are. I assume you have real world experience with that, with the, the firms that you work for. Um, President Corrigan, would you like to start? Any tips for, for everyone watching for successful entry into the profession? Yes, I have a few. Maintain a healthy grade point average. Get those A's and B's. Don't let the grade point average slip because that will distinguish you from the next candidate. Take as many additional courses as you can. Become as well-rounded as you can with your education. And then take that CPA exam just as soon as you can while your education is fresh. It's a tough exam. You know, you go through the rigors of testing all kinds of categories. So take it as soon as you can. And then to remember that when you're selecting a firm, be very careful that that firm can provide what you need to grow, that they can provide the training and more on the job education to get you to that license that you're working for so you can become certified. In those first two to three years, you wanna become well-rounded so that if you are choosing to specialize, you have a feel for what's out there and what direction you may go, what direction you may choose. Mr. Hurley, any tips from you? Maybe specific skills that could be um, for a successful accounting career? I talk to a lot of firms and there's, there's a running joke in my circle. I, everybody's asking me, Mike, you get around, surely there's a dis, um, 
a tax manager for some firm who's looking for a job that is, you know, reached out to you, well, that person's got 500 job offers already. Hmm. Um, if I was brand new and I'm in college and I'm getting ready to join the profession, it's going to bounce this off the panel members, watch their reaction. Don't be afraid to do an HR or Bach tax class. Get any experiences you can. Nancy's comment about being well-rounded is key. Get some tax experience. When you join a firm, they'll give you audit and accounting experience. The more experiences you have, the better. And then being a good listener, I, I, it's not really taught in school. Learn to force yourself to learn to listen to people. And if you're a good communicator, if you can learn to listen to clients, that will really help you get a job. I know when I'm doing interviews, when my staff is doing interviews, they're looking for people who can listen and communicate well. If you can do those things, you'll be able to get a job in our profession and we can teach you most everything else you need to have. All right. Mr. Lee, what do you think? I, I just add on to that. Have somebody read your resume before you send it to somebody. So often I get resumes, there's misspellings on it, the grammar's off. You just get yourself thrown out of the pile because you, honestly, the hardest job you'll probably try to apply for in public accounting is your first year trying to get into the firm. That's where that's going to be the hardest one. After you've got some experience, you've got a lot of flexibility and ability to move around. But make sure that resume is clear. Have somebody who's not an accountant read it. Stand out a little bit different. You know, don't take the standard approach uh, always on your resume. Secondly, if you're not free with your speech and easily going along in an interview, practice interviewing with somebody. Take a couple of classes on how to interview. Get that, get that language down. Make that flow off of your lips easily when you're in that interview process because that's going to help you stand out. If you're constantly trying to look back and come up with an answer, you're not going to stand out in the direction you want to stand out. So I would practice those things uh, and, and watch for that. And then do your homework on the firms you're going to interview with. So, because you will get asked the question, what questions do you have for us? And if you have no questions, because you've done no research on the firm, it just gets you knocked down in the interview process. So do your homework, be prepared. Very good advice. Yes. Uh, Mr. Savoy. I would say internships are extremely important. If you're intending on going to work for a larger firm, right out of the box, they ask you if you want to be an auditor or a tax person. I think that's highly unfair to a student coming out of school to have to pick his expertise immediately when they have no idea other than flipping a coin or possibly whatever job was available. I think it's tremendously important that if you can do internships at selective firms, so you get both accounting and tax work, when it comes time to specializing, you'll at least have an idea. Tax people generally like to stay in the office, not necessarily deal or communicate as much as auditors that are always out in the field but you have to reach your comfort level in who you are and what you want to do. Myself, I've been a dinosaur all these years. I know as much about accounting and auditing and tax to get into trouble, but at least I've experienced both and know what I enjoy more than the other. And I'd only stress that you should experience both disciplines before you decide on which one you want to settle on. Do you have any thoughts about the future of perhaps working remotely in the accounting profession? Do you see that going any particular direction? You know, what's pretty interesting is if you asked me two years ago, I would say, you know, one day a week, you know, pick a day, work from home so you don't have to commute. Unfortunately, with this pandemic, Firms are now realizing they can get as much work done remotely as they can in the office. Uh, 
I don't always agree because there's a certain amount of discipline and synergies in seeing somebody down the hall. Uh, oh, I got something for you to do. You know, how's, how's it going? It's a little harder to communicate uh, remotely, but it is the wave of the future. Uh, the firm we just merged with has employees in New York, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Chicago, the, you know, so I think it is the future. And I just want to point out that I forgot to mention whether the uh, candidates realize it or not. We are short in our profession. There's a tremendous shortage in good quality employees. So if you graduate and you're a warm body, you will get a job in public accounting. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've read the articles that you know the 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 older generation are retiring, and there's there's the need for the younger generation coming up. So you you attest to that. You you see that happening in your your firm. Yeah. Absolutely, uh, the baby boomers have reached their pretty much <laughs> time. Myself being one of them, and. I'm not saying to uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater because we do provide a certain amount of institutional knowledge, but it is a profession for the young and a good bright person can move very quickly in a CPA firm if they're put their mind to it. So uh, absolutely. That's great and great news for all of you who are watching this tonight. So you're taking that first step and you're already ahead of quite a few others so you're in the right place all right president corrigan i'm going to end with kind of a fun one for you and just if there's a common misconception maybe of what a cpa does that everyone thinks cpas do do this but that's not really the case what do you what would be your answer to that that's a very easy one david now they think we're all just about numbers and telling this and telling that i'm telling you it is a service business, a service profession, communication, that is interpersonal, verbal, written, communication, interaction, the listening skills, and all of those things are really critical. It's about serving and taking care of those clients and dealing with, with those problems, those issues. Try to take ownership of an issue and solve it as if it were your own. So we're not just, a, you know, boring and with numbers. It's actually a very, very exciting profession that I have loved for my entire career. Very good. All right. Nothing boring about any of you. Thank you to our panel. That's wonderful. All right. Everyone watching, let's go. Let's give them a, a, some sort of a heart, some sort of an emoji. Let's get those emojis floating up on the screen. They did a great job. That's many, many years of experience that you just hopefully absorbed a lot of that from. Okay, so we'll finish off the evening with uh, a question and answer session. So I've just opened the question and answer feature. I know I, I did leave the chat on. I had actually intended to turn it off, but I know some of our uh, CBA staff has already been answering a few questions. But go ahead right now and jump in, whether it's something from the presentations you heard earlier, whether it's something to one of our panelists, we will jump in and... Um, answer as many as we can. So let's start off with this one. If I pass all four exams in 2022 and work for a year to fulfill my working requirements, when I eventually apply for a CPA in 2023, will I need CPE, which would be for um, continuing education? So Diane, do you want to take that question? So talk about, I guess, do you need CE when you're applying for your license? So um, it would be very rare that you would need continuing education. Um, that would, there's very few people, those would be people that would, had more than five years between passing the exam and their, um, I'm sorry, and their work experience before applying. So in that situation, you would not need continuing education. Um, it's actually a misconception. People will take continuing education and it does you, it's not considered once you try to renew. 
or at least that's my understanding. So you should be taking courses for semester or quarter units only. Yeah, so right for, for most people, there's no continuing education needed at yeah. that point that only comes after you. After you get your license, very, very few. Okay. Uh, is California alone in implementing a new exam format? Jen, do you want to take that one? No, this is a, a, across the states. This is um, being implemented by NASBA and AICPA. Um, it is not unique to California. Let's keep some exam questions coming your way. Uh, someone asks, uh, Noreen, should I take the exam section in the same order listed in my CBA account? Because I selected all four at once. Thank you. I'm sorry, you're asking if all four sections need to be taken at once? Well, she said it's... in the same order. So why don't you address that first? Okay. And... The order that you decide and the amount of sections you decide to take at one time is is up to you. Um, you'll want to consider your work habits, your study habits, the, the allowance of time you have to dedicate towards each section. But there's no specific order in which you need to take each of those four sections. It's entirely up to you. Whether you take one, two, three, or all four um, at one time, your decision and your order. Just need to get them done within 18 months. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the key. Brenda says, do I need a master's to fulfill the additional education credits? That's Diane. For the exam, you do not need a master's. You need a minimum of your bachelor's degree and simply the 24 accounting units and the 24 business units. The master's degree would be more on the licensing side. Right, Diane, do you wanna jump on that? Sorry, that should have been you. Yeah. So um, you are not required to have a master's of accounting or um, taxation. The only benefit to that would be that you're not required to have the 20 semester units of accounting study. But honestly, the courses that you'd have to take to obtain a master's of accounting, a master of taxation, you would be fulfilling that anyways. So if you've already um, fulfilled all of your courses, you can take courses through um, community college if you're just looking to meet the 150 semester requirement. Mr. Savoy, we have a question for you from Hugo. Can you talk about some of the most exciting boards you've been a part of? Ooh, I've been on a board of uh, called BKR International, which at that time was 175 firms across 72 countries, over 300 cities. And the greatest part of that uh, was the travel. How many countries I've been to. When I was the US chairman, I got to go to the uh, European meeting, to the Asia Pacific meeting, to the worldwide meeting, whether it was Hong Kong, Barcelona. I've been all over the world just from being on that board. So. Uh, it's it's given me some opportunities to uh, meet some incredible people, people I call lifetime friends. And so I would, if I had to go back, I would do it all over again. All right, Mr. Hurley, I see you actually addressed this already, but for, for all of us, um, Serena asked, are you regretting that you didn't start in public accounting first rather than private accounting? What is your advice for someone who's been working in private and is ready to go into public? I have to tell you, I, I love talking to peer review clients about how did you get to where you are? A surprising number of middle sized firm partners started in private and then switched to public. Um, very often people that start in public wonder, and they have the grass is greener effect going, they'll leave public and go private. Coming out of private, you bring a set of knowledge with you that makes you more valuable than somebody coming straight out of school. 
And I know a lot of small firms, my firm would prefer to have people work a couple of years before they came into public. That said, we will take anybody right now. If you're graduating, please apply to my firm. <laughs> but whatever you bring, everything you accumulate, you take with you. And the more experiences you have, the better. Somebody who's worked in private is more valuable to us than somebody coming straight out of school because of the experience. So, very good. Like you're precluded. Please, please, if you're in private right now, do you have any interest in public? Please apply. <laughs> Hussein says, can a non-U.S. citizen who does not live in the U.S. be a CPA? Yes, if we have um, quite a few licensees who are out of country. Okay, Kate says, uh, let's go. Okay, asking for a friend, Jonas says, what's the best path to achieve the education requirement for someone 20 plus years removed from their MBA? Maybe that's uh, something for one of the panelists. I might be able to take that. You might go look at one of the CAP programs at some of the schools. They'll have intensive studies that will get you through the accounting classes in about six to nine months, depending on the school. Okay. Good. Let's go. Those are not for the weak of heart, by the way. <laughs> Francisco says, um, are the 2424 apart from the other credits mentioned needed, or can they merge as well? Jen. I think you're muted. Sorry about that. There you are. <laughs> For the She's exams. actually right over here, so I can <laughs> I heard her here but not here. <laughs> the 2424 um that you're going to accumulate for your exam section is going to be separate from what you're going um not necessarily separate, but people get confused thinking that the examination requirements are the same as the licensing requirements and they are not at the time of exam you'll simply need to show us 24 accounting units 24 business units and your bachelor's degree after you've passed your exams and you move on to the licensing you aren't stuck using those same 24 that you use to meet the accounting requirement for the exam site and the same 24 that you use for business. You can reallocate those courses as needed um, to fulfill the requirements needed on the licensing side. And Diane can maybe talk about your self-assessment sheet that can help them in assisting breaking down their, their courses. Yeah, um, I did want to mention um, the 20 semester units of accounting study and the 10 semester units of ethics study are in addition to the 24 semester units of business and 24 semester units of accounting subjects. Um, you cannot double count courses. So if you're counting a course towards your accounting subjects, you cannot count it towards the six semester units that are required for the, um, I'm sorry, the six semester units of accounting subjects that are required for the accounting study. Now, when, it may not always feel like it, but we are looking at your education and we are trying to make it meet our requirements. So if we can, we'll divide a course, say a three semester unit accounting course, we can divide it between the accounting subjects and the um, accounting, uh, sorry, the accounting study as because we want to make you meet legally. So, but when I'm looking at self assessments, I do see people double count courses a lot and then they're surprised when they don't meet the requirements. Yeah, we're trying to get you approved. That's our goal. We're not trying, we're not here to deny you if we, if we don't have to. Um, Jen, here's a question for you that we're starting to get this question a lot and we don't have too many of the details yet about the new uh, CPA evolution. But uh, Min says, if I pass two or three parts before the change in January 2024, would I be affected and how will the change affect my previous score? Do we know enough about that? 
your scores will remain and you're not going to lose any credit unless it's outside of that 18 month window. You will not lose any credit um, earned, any scores earned. Uh, question for the panelists. Have any panelists ever considered becoming a certified fraud examiner in lieu of their CPA or in addition to it? I know I gave it some thought, um, but frankly, I was just too busy with what I was doing. I know some people that have done it and they've quite enjoyed it. Um, it, it becomes a specialty into itself and I prefer the generalist approach. Same answer. I've done some of that work uh, without being a certified fraud examiner. Uh, it's almost like being a detective in trying to uncover something, a fraud of some type. Uh, you know, it's it's really interesting, but I don't think it's something that I wanted to bank my whole career on. <laughs> Diane, here's one for you from Raymond. Can a chartered accountant supervisor from the UK from an international company approve of CPA uh, hours in California? So for the experience requirement. We do consider um, experience that is earned from a foreign country. Um, there's, I'm sorry, so, um, I, I'm looking because I want to have the exact information for you. Um, when we're looking at foreign experience, what we're looking at is the, for the private, if you're working private industry or government, your supervisor must be licensed in the United States. But if you're working for a public accounting firm, your supervisor can possess a public accountant license issued by a foreign authority. Yeah, I know there's some verification involved, but that can that yeah. can definitely happen. Yep. Uh, to Jen from Jacqueline, once my first exam is taken, how soon can I take the next one? It's just dependent on your schedule and the availability of um, Prometric. There's no restriction to take an exam back to back um, or two or three exams within the same week. The only restriction um, with exam dates is if you fail a section, which you won't, <laughs> um, you will have to wait for the release of your score to see that you actually failed before you can reschedule for that same section um, and do a repeat application so that you can go through the process again and then reschedule yourself for this section. But you can take as many as you want just upon the avail um, availability of yourself and Prometric sites. And you can do it either by scheduling multiple sections with one NTS, right? Or if you only do one section with the one NTS, you can come right back and reapply immediately, right? There's no, you can have multiple NTSs open at the same time, right? Correct. You could have multiple sections within one NTS as, as well. Right. And if you do it that way, if you apply, then you save yourself a little money, right? Because it does cost you a fee every time. So just throwing that out there, trying to help you all. Uh, let's see, do we need, uh, Vinny says, do we need to get education credentials reevaluated when applying for the CPA license? That's a good question. Uh, when we already got the credentials evaluated for the exams. Uh, Diane, take that. No, there, there's no need to have foreign education reevaluated when uh, you apply for your license, as long as you had it apply. I'm sorry, as long as you had it reviewed when you applied for the um, CPA exam. It's very important, though, if to, to understand that it must be evaluated for California. So if you had it evaluated for like another state and you're trying to get licensed here, we wouldn't be able to accept that. Paul says, once you pass the exam, how long are the results good for? We've talked about finishing requirements within two years of passing the ethics exam. What is the counterpart for the CPA exam? Jen, there's good news on that one. 
Currently, we do not have an expiration date for exam scores. If that changes in the future, I have not heard of any talk of that, but as of right now, your, um, your scores do not expire. Once you've successfully completed all four sections and you've passed the exam, that will not expire. Sorry. Right. So you don't have to immediately apply for your CP no. license. Once you've passed the exam, you're, you're good. Uh, here's one for the panel. Lily says, is it ever too late to start trying to earn your CPA? That's a nice softball question. Well, I will start the response to that and I would say, no, it is never too late, especially with the demand right now, the market and it's such an exciting um, profession. So I don't know why it would be too late. I think it's something that you should dive into, take all the resources that we've provided, contact CBA staff again if you have specific questions and go for it. Uh, Ramey says, can the 500 attest hours be obtained before I apply to take the CPA exam? Diane. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, for the 500 attest hours, can they be obtained? Is there any, basically, is there any uh, rule to when those hours can be obtained? No, we do not have a requirement. You could be obtaining your uh, experience even when you're taking the exam. Uh, here's a good one for the panel. Uh, what advice would you give for one to better deal with difficult ethical situations in the workplace? You want to take that first, President Corrigan? Advice for dealing with uh, difficult ethical situations. Difficult ethical situations in the workplace, and I'm not sure if they're referring to, you know, personnel, which I don't want to address, or client Same situations, thing. but I think the best thing to do is to gather the information, the facts, and talk to an immediate supervisor, someone who's in charge of the engagement, so that uh, it can be handled appropriately with the client to determine whether to go forward with the client and with the situation or whether it's something, a situation where the firm just needs to maybe withdraw from an engagement. Yeah, I, th I think the easiest answer is to fire the client, uh, but certainly you shouldn't make that decision on your own. You should seek help from within your organization whether it's another partner or a partner and just go up the chain so that it's a firm decision, not an individual decision. Your opinion might be, I just can't work with this person. He's too difficult uh, and he's demanding of us what we're not capable of doing, but it should be a firm decision, not individual. Jen, question for you. Is there a uh, limit to a number of times you can reapply for a single or all exams? There is no limit. Um, I've seen people pass the exam on their first try within just a matter of months. We've seen people retake it over and over. There, there's no maximum um, attempt to take the exam. Uh, Kristen did say, can I submit my certificate of a test experience prior to having passed all sections? And that is something that we, uh, we mentioned before that, that yes, you can send in and we recommend you doing that. Right. Um, so that way, you know, if a signer goes on, moves on to another job or something, as soon as you get that experience form, get it into us, we will hold on to it. Uh, until you are ready to apply. Uh, and yes, we are, somebody also asked, are you gonna be able to view a recording of this? And we are going to post it on the CBA website uh, at some point in the next few weeks, as quickly as we can get it, get it up there. So go to the cba.ca.gov, right? That's our website. And then it'll be under the communications and outreach tab. All right, let's see if we can grab maybe a couple more. It's just a little past 7.30. See if I can find a couple more. 
Oh, this, uh, Jen, do you want to try this one? Hi, my name is Harmon. I have a question regarding the requirements for educational credits. What happens if one of the schools I went to closed down and I cannot get the transcripts? What would I need to do? I honestly don't have an answer <laughs> for this. Um, Diane, have you ever experienced, I, I've, in my three years, I have not experienced uh, an institution closing. Um, I think, actually, I know that this has happened in the past. Uh, it's very rare, but my understanding is when a school closes, there's an entity that uh, maintains their transcripts. So, um, but I'm not sure exactly who you would have to contact, but my understanding is transcripts are maintained. Okay, well, thank you so much everyone for, for all those questions. Got to as many of those as we can. If you did have a question that we were unable to answer, go ahead and email outreach at cba.ca.gov. And uh, I take a peek at that uh, email box so I will get you an answer. So outreach at cba.ca.gov and we will get, Back to you. Well, on behalf of all of us at the California Board of Accountancy, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, like I mentioned, we will put a recording up uh, shortly on our website, so please go and do that. And uh, thank you again for our panelists. We very much appreciate your taking the time out of your busy, busy schedules to uh, to help everyone and hopefully start grooming the, the next generation of those CPAs that will be coming along. CBA staff, thank you so much. For all of that and for all of you attending, we really thank you so much. Remember the CBA, we're always here to help. Have a great rest of your night and best of luck on the pathway to your CPA. Good night.